Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Child Anxiety Fact Podcast. My name is Dawn Friedman, and I'm the owner of Child Anxiety Support, a membership for parents of anxious kids. I have my master's in clinical counseling and additional postgraduate training in child anxiety disorders, including exposure and response prevention and the Supportive Parenting for Anxious Childhood Emotions Program, or SPACE program, which was designed by Dr. Ellie Levowitz of the Yale Child Study Center. I'm also certified in infant toddler mental health. FACT stands for Frequently Asked Questions, and each week I'll be answering your questions about childhood and teen anxiety. Let's get started. This week's question is, are there any downsides to practicing gentle parenting with an anxious child? This question is a simplified version of one I get often in various forms. Usually, the person reaching out identifies as a gentle parent, and they're struggling because someone else in their life and in their child's life, whether that's a co-parent, a grandparent, another caregiver, is critical of gentle parenting practices. Gentle parenting has become a popular term to describe parenting that back in my day fell under the label attachment parenting. You may also hear this described as respectful parenting or conscious parenting. And sure, there might be subtle differences in the way people apply these labels, but generally we're talking about parents who are working hard to be tuned into and connected to their kids. How this looks might be a focus on discussion, respect for a child's feelings and point of view, and more collaboration far less punishment. Outsiders tend to dismiss gentle parenting as helicopter parenting or overparenting. They may call it spoiling. Gentle parents are often blamed for their kids' behavior or struggles. People may say, you're being too easy on them. They're manipulating you. Gentle parenting might get confused with permissive parenting, where there are no rules or guidance. There are definitely rules and guidance in gentle parenting, although this may not look the same as in more traditional parenting. For the gentle parent who has a more challenging kid, it's even more complicated. Those challenges may be what brought them to gentle parenting. They may have realized that this is a child who needs a different approach. Or the gentle parent may have come to this style of parenting because of their own childhood, either wanting to parent in similar ways to their own gentle parents or because they are critical of the ways they were raised and want to do things differently. I'll share that most of the people who reach out to me are the latter, people who are trying to parent differently and who sometimes find themselves up against their own strong feelings about a situation they went through as a kid and are struggling to figure out what is right for their own child, not really having an example, and so often they are relying on outsiders whether that's books or podcasts or other experts, to figure out what to do. They struggle with their own instincts. And they do worry about overparenting, but the gentle parents that I tend to work with worry much more about underparenting. I hope this sets the general stage for our discussion about how this impacts child anxiety and child anxiety treatment. Now I'll let you know, I identified as an attachment parent in my own parenting career. And I spent a lot of time on email groups devoted to this kind of parenting. That's what we had instead of Facebook. We had listservs. And in many of those groups, there was a kind of litmus test for whether or not you qualified as a true attachment parent, which I tell you now is ridiculous. Any list that says you're either out or you're in, you either do this or you don't matter, you don't count, that's ridiculous. That kind of binary, that kind of either you're right or you're wrong, can create a lot of anxiety in parents, but especially in parents who are trying to learn a new way of parenting, who are trying to do this differently than the way they were raised. Gentle parenting younger kids, that can be pretty straightforward. You know, no crying it out, no physical discipline, lots of discussion, but it gets a lot trickier as kids get older. The reason why there are fewer parenting books as kids grow up is that their development becomes much more individualized. Toddlers tend to all be more or less in the same ballpark. Teenagers, on the other hand, are all on totally different playing fields. 
But even those kids who are in the same developmental zone are unique people, and you as a parent are unique too. So anyone who tells you that there's one right way to raise all kids doesn't know what they're talking about. While there are some things that we know from research, like physical discipline has a lot of negative outcome for kids and for the relationship, there is lots of nuance about other things like time out or sleep choices or schooling. So I have to tell you that my parenting philosophy as an educator and as a counselor and as someone who's worked with lots of families and kids is that you and your child are meant to build and teach and grow each other. You're the parent, so you're going to be making the bulk of the decisions, obviously, like where to live and how to spend the money and how to make the money and all of those big picture things. But those big picture things obviously are influenced by the child you get. I remember I had very strong ideas about how to parent that were shaped by my time as a preschool teacher, which I did before I had kids. Then I had my son, and a lot of those great ideas didn't fit him. While I was definitely the decider, my son shaped me to be the parent he needed. Tuning into his needs with a background on general child development helped me with my decision making. Not that it was always easy. Then his sister came along. She was a totally different person with totally different needs, and she shaped me again. The tools and techniques that I nailed with my son didn't always work for her. I'm telling you this to remind you that ultimately, you are the expert on your child. No parenting educator, me or anyone else, knows more about your kid than you do. What I know about, and what other educators know about, are children in general. I have expertise in child development and child anxiety, and a broad range of parenting styles, techniques, tips, all of that. And what I have to say may be useful to you, but it's only useful when it's filtered through your expertise and experience. Back to gentle parenting. Many self-identified gentle parents are worried about getting it right. It's one of the reasons they came to this style of parenting. Between the groups and the books and the podcasts like this and the Instagram and the TikTok, it can feel like there are a lot of rules you have to keep track of. And I'm telling you right now that your relationship with your child is the most essential piece. That doesn't mean you always have to like each other. Sometimes kids don't like parents and sometimes parents aren't liking their kids. That's okay. If there is central love and respect, you can lean on that as you do the hard work of growing together. In fact, my belief, based on my three decades of experience, is that when you aren't liking each other or when you're not liking parenting, this is a wonderful indicator for you that things need to change. Instead of fighting that feeling, I think parents and kids are best served when they acknowledge it and recognize it as a tool. Gentle parents tend to feel guilty instead of remembering that the reason we do all that hard work of gentle parenting is so that we can trust the relationship. Trust the messages within the relationship, including the ones that say, hey, this isn't working for us anymore, and then we can change things up. There is a natural ebb and flow to parenting, a weaning dance that begins the minute you first hold your child and goes on even after they move out. Sometimes the ebb is evident through the conflict or unhappiness in the relationship, and we need to adjust things to get back into flow. So if you're struggling, I'd like you to reframe this as, I'm a good parent with a good kid, so this frustration or conflict or stuck feeling is a sign that I can trust that we're ready for something new. For gentle parents, anxiety treatment can be tough because it means your child is going to be upset and you're going to be the one that's either upsetting them or not preventing their upset. Gentle parents tend to be much more vulnerable to the parenting pitfalls, and they tend to need more support as they learn to get unstuck. But this is not caused by gentle parenting. It's caused by parents who are still growing in confidence as parents, and it's a sign that we get to grow in that confidence. We all have insecure times, times when we think, this poor kid, I've got no idea what I'm doing but the gentle parent just tends to be much harder on themselves. 
Now, there are some things I have noticed about gentle parents, and the big one is that we tend to talk too much. We tend to reassure too often. That's a big parenting pitfall for gentle parents. And we often avoid dealing with anxiety, hoping we can wait until we get buy-in from our children. And that's not realistic. Anxious kids don't usually say, hey, I need you to push me out of my comfort zone. So we're going to have to do it even when they've dug in their heels. There's a clear way to do this. I'm not asking you to just throw them off a bridge or something. But there's no getting around that it's not going to feel great. And that's one thing. Good parenting does not always feel good. We tend to over-explain. I tell gentle parents that most of us are parenting via discussion, and that's great. But sometimes we need to skip the conversation and focus on action. When I taught preschool, there was one lovely little boy named Daniel. As an aside, Daniel is in his late 30s now, which obviously makes me feel really old. Anyway, back to Daniel. Daniel often got into three-year-old kinds of trouble, you know, upending routines or whatever. And I'd take him aside and we would have a quiet, private time to discuss and process this. We realized I was creating a problem when he did something, I don't know, spilled his juice on purpose or knocked over someone's block tower. And the other teacher stepped in and he looked up with his bright and shiny face and said with a big smile, do I get to talk to Don now? And we realized we were doing a great job of teaching him that the way to get special time with me was to do something not so great for the classroom. And that's what gentle parents tend to do. They are taking their child's worries so seriously, processing them so much that they mistakenly elevate those worries. We often want to get to the bottom of things. We want to know the why of things. Why is our child scared of butterflies? What's scaring them at bedtime? Lots of times, our kids don't even know. And frankly, they don't have to know and neither do we. We can just trust them that they find butterflies in bedtime scary. And we can create a plan to help them with this without digging in and shining a great big important light on it. Sometimes, especially with little kids, they so don't know that trying to have a big talk about it will actually create the reason. So let's say our child runs screaming from butterflies. And yes, we explain to them why butterflies are safe. Maybe we do a whole thing about butterflies, ordering monarch caterpillars to grow in our house, heading to the library for butterfly books, and that's all great. A non-anxious child will take this and run with it. An anxious child might, but they might also get stuck. Again, experiments and books and things are terrific. Those are exposures, and exposures are good for anxiety. But anxious kids can be black holes where they need more and more and more. An explanation every time processing every butterfly sighting. This is different than a child who's genuinely interested. The child with genuine interest will go towards the butterfly opportunities. The anxious child will not and will instead continue to insist on your help, the discussion, the processing. Remember, the reason why the parenting pitfalls are so sticky is that they work for non-anxious kids. And so we keep using them for our anxious kids, not realizing that we're stuck, like the scratch in a record. We're doing the same things over and over again. More discussion, more preparation, more hand-holding at parks where there are butterflies. That's when it becomes a pitfall. And again, this is where we can lean on your feelings as a parent. If you're tired of talking about it, if you're feeling like, oh my gosh, this again, then that's a sign that things need to change. What we need to do as gentle parents with anxious kids is explain once, process once, then remain supportive, but from a comfortable distance where we have curiosity, but are reminding them and pushing them to rely on their own strengths and resources and not avoiding. So what might this look like? You do those things with your anxious child, explain, share resources, look at books, etc., the next time at the field, when our child runs screaming to us about butterflies, we help calm them, perhaps a quick hug, but we keep our focus off of it. We display a confidence that all is well. That might mean continuing a conversation with our friend who's with us or just remaining friendly, neutral with our child. It's not ignoring them, but it's shifting our attention to something other than the butterflies. We might put the processing back on them. 
Remember that book we got out at the library? What do you think that butterfly is doing? We can validate without getting stuck. Yeah, I remember that butterflies can make you feel nervous. I also know you can handle this. The goal here is not perfection. It's helping them grow into being able to handle it. It's the anxiety version of letting go of the bike when they're learning to ride, but sticking close by. It's not continuing to hold on. It's not panicking as they ride, even if we feel a little panicky inside. It's rolling with it. It's knowing that if they do fall, they'll be okay, even if they're less sure about that. To finish up, the thing I want you to know is that by choosing gentle parenting, you have created a bank of good parenting. You have made a sound deposit in your child's well being and in the relationship. You have been trustworthy, respectful, and you can lean on that. You can lean on that foundation. You can create flexibility and movement in the relationship by asking more of them. They will grow through this, even if it feels hard sometimes, and you will grow too. Both of you will grow in distress tolerance and in being able to stretch to meet the next challenge. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. If you have a question you would like me to answer on the show, please go to childanxietysupport.com forward slash FAQ. And if you'd like to learn more about the Child Anxiety Support membership, please go to childanxietysupport.com. The membership offers courses, live events, and community to help you design a personalized program to free your family from the trap of child anxiety. I hope you'll consider subscribing to the podcast and sharing it with any friends or family who you think might find it helpful. You can get more of my child anxiety content over at Instagram, where I'm Dawn Friedman, MSED, or on Facebook at the Child Anxiety Support page. Thanks again, and have a great week.